Well, hello and welcome to PM Express. The big, big uh, topic is back on the uh, table again, and that's solar energy. Now, the president recently in India said that in, uh, in uh, accordance with the Paris Accord, Ghana is also going to adhere to renewable energies, tapping into our solar energy. And solar energy is one of those things that we've talked about many, many, many times, that indeed we have a lot of sun. The sun is generating a lot of power. And yes, all we do is come out and chop our cassavas and leave it on the side of the road for it to dry. And for us, that's the use of the sun. But let's look at the reality. Can individuals afford it? Do we have the land size to big, uh, put up big uh, panels so that we can generate energy? How do we store it? What happens when the moon comes up? Do we now go back on the grid? What are the realities of the solar energy? Because it seems as if it's a low hanging fruit that Ghana, indeed Africa, has ignored for a long time. Germany in its temperate zones are using 33% renewable energy out of which a lot is solar. So what are we doing and what are we waiting for? However difficult it is, it looks as if we have to start and the time is now. But we're going to talk about the realities. You in your home, can you afford to fix solar energy in your house? Those who are running corporations and factories, are you going on solar energy? Are we going to split it up? So domestic use solar and industry use the grid? Well, that's the issue on the table today. Don't go at all. It's going to be a very, very exciting conversation. My name is Nana Asakwa, the fourth chief of the Little Republic of Akwebu. I do myself. When I come back, I'm talking to an energy expert. Don't go. Well, thank you very much for staying. And we are looking at Ghana increasing solar energy. Is it feasible? With me in the studio is uh, my own brother, Kojo Poku. Kojo, uh, thank you very much for coming. Good evening. It's always a pleasure to be here. I know. It's been a while. It's been yes. a while. Uh, Kojo, I'm just looking at a chart here, and it says share of energy sources uh, gross Germany power production in 2017, and 33.1% renewables, uh, out of which, uh, beg your pardon, you know, solar is about, uh, I think, 6.1% of that 33%, percent you go going solar. And Germany is quite cold, it snows a lot. So that making use of that little sun that they have. What is the reality with the solar discussion? I mean, this is not the first time we've talked about solar. No, it's not. Yeah. We've what had... is the reality? Is it feasible? Well, it's very feasible. Um, what has made Ghana and Sub-Saharan Africa not catch up with the solar conversation is the cost of solar. Mm. Um, you know, in 2009, I think Obama's initiative was to basically spend a lot of money in new innovation in solar. So in one of the drives for the U.S. economy was to put a lot of money into research and you know, new technology for solar. And I think that made the U.S. come at the forefront of coming out with new you know, inventions and new ways of making solar, driving the price of solar down. And now it's quite reasonable to be able to install solar in this part of the world. So one of the um, things that made people not go for solar in the past was the cost of installation, the cost of the equipment and the cost of installation and also maintenance of the solar. You know, because you know what really happens with solar is there are three parts of solar. The first part is the photocells, which is the panels, which the sun hits and it converts the sun radiation into energy. Then you need to store that energy. So then you have batteries that sits there and that um, energy which has been turned from the sun is stored in the batteries. Now, then there is the wiring. So the most important part of solar is the batteries. Because obviously, when the sun is on most part of the day, you need to harness that energy and have it there when it's not there. 
So to be able to now have a lengthy time of when you get access to that power or energy is the batteries that you have. And you realize that a lot of um, innovation and a lot of new technology has gone into the batteries. Okay, and that is where and that is where the big money is spent, and that is what is making solar a bit more attractive now because now there are decent technology for the batteries in the system now. Well, well, I mean, it, solar stayed expensive for far too long, considering when solar was discovered. I mean, with most inventions, you know, mobile phones, laptop iPads, you know, they come and, you know, the price is so high. The next thing you know is buy one, get one free. But, I mean, solar seems to be, you know, became expensive for far too long. Because it's really who needs it. You know, um, renewable energy has really become the need, not because of us. It's because of global warming. You know, it's really become that, look, how are we generating our normal um, electricity, thermal, fossil fuel, okay? And the minute it became that, look, hydrocarbon is, needs to be fizzled out. Fossil fuels has to be checked. Then our ozone layers has to be checked. So what is really driving renewable energy? It's not that Africans need solar. It's because the world needs to find alternative sorts of energy. And because the world needs to find alternative sorts of energy, that is what is making their innovators, the Europeans, mm -hmm. now drive that technology. That is why it's becoming cheaper. In the past, it was a technology that Africa can use because they have the sun. You know, the, world, the West had the gas to power <coughs> their thermals. They had the coal to power their power plants. So, I mean, solar was not something that they wanted to do. But now the solar um, thermal plants has all, sorry, the coal, the coal thermal plants have all been phased out. The world is thinking green. And when it comes to green renewable energy, solar stands out. Mm -hmm. Then you come to wind. Then you come to all the other renewables that you can think of. So that is what is driving the price down now because they are thinking renewable green energy, not because Africa needs to use it. I mean, so going forward, what is it going to be? A policy to say, look, 5% of your household... Uh, energy should be solar so that when you are building, you know that to get a planning, planning permit, well, I mean, who even gets a planning permit? But I mean, to, to, <laughs> I don't know, you know uh, something that yeah. says, look, you should have a certain percentage, or I mean, how, how are we going to go well, forward? Well, one of the, the main giant steps that we took as a country was the passage of the 2011 Act, which is the Renewable Energy Act, 832. Mm -hmm. That was a giant step because that came in to set out the roadmap, so to speak. And it also even went further to now tell us what as residential, if let's say I want to generate more than I need, I can now sell it to next door neighbors and get rebates from electricity companies, so be it. Mm. But coming forward, I think governments have had a different approach to how they want to promote solar. Um, in the last four years, there was a lot of drive from various companies coming into the country to try to do solar. One major one that was done was the two megawatts one that was done in the northern region and was put on the national grid. But I think right after that, going forward, everybody realized, look, hold on. Why are we putting solar on the national grid two megawatts when the, set, the losses on this grid does not even make these... Um, solar on our national grid very mm. effective and also the instability nature of the solar makes it very 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 um not suitable for the grid so then the <coughs> embedded generation concept came up that why do you need to pipe it onto the grid why don't you have maybe in your town or in my town if we just need five megawatts for Puano or the Amancia area, why not just do five megawatts for that communities <coughs> and don't necessarily have to put it on a national grid, transmit it for long distance and lose it on the grid. So the embedded generation where solar were to be put in for communities started coming up. In the central region, I think some Chinese company came and did 20 megawatts for that area and it's up and running. Most of the companies were coming in there was a process of setting up the price. 
the PULC had what is called a gazetted price, which is the feeding tariff. So the PULC had a price which, if you come in and say, look, I want to do solar, they say, look, <coughs> this is a feeding tariff from PULC. It's X dollars or X cents. If you can meet that price, then go ahead and build it, and you will get a power purchase agreement with ECG or whoever your offtake is. Fast forwarding that, in recent times, there's been a change in policy, okay? And that policy, I think, came up the latter part of the NDC administration and now within the MPP administration that solar or renewable energy would be only, would only be acquired by ECG on a tender <laughs> or competitive bidding process, which has really stalled that whole thing. Because if you are expecting people to wait to do competitive bidding before they can now go ahead and build all these um, solar plants that they want to do, then it becomes a bit disincentive because competitive bidding in what? Because everybody has a different technology <coughs> when it comes to solar. So if I have a different technology and you have a different technology, how and why are we being asked to do a competitive bidding? <coughs> the process where PULC was asked to set a price, then anybody that comes into the country doesn't need to wait for competitive bidding. They can just go into any area, they can do their feasibility in that area and say, look, I can set up in this area, let ECG, who are the distributors, give me um, a power purchase agreement. Mm -hmm. If I generate, they buy it and they generate to the community. That to me was helping promote renewable energy. Than the now the policy, which to me is a disincentive for all the renewable projects that's coming along. Two, two issues. These community ones, so do they supply at night as well or at night you go off the grid? No. It's, that's <coughs> why the, the inverters, which is the batteries, basically the technology now exists that there is enough battery or energy stored in these batteries to last you for the next 24 hours. To, so supply, what, the to supply the community. So these are not just um, residential um, base solar. These are high-end solar with high mm. power batteries, so it can store as much. There's a company called Tesla. Yeah. Tesla is much in the news these days mm. when it comes to solar and their innovatives electric in electric cars and stuff like that. Tesla has now done these innovative batteries out there that these inverters can now be used for much longer time than when it was. So there is a lot of technology. So in the communities that you do the 20 megawatts, there are the banks of batteries, everything is set up. They harness the, the sun energy and the battery storage, and they can now um, distribute in that community for 24 hours and more. Mm. Now, with regards to bidding, uh, could you, I mean, look at it from this. If, if you're asked to bid, because if I set a price that will come and supply, you know, 10 cents per kilowatt, whatever it is, maybe somebody can do five cents per kilowatt. So uh, get them to bid and see if you can get something lower. Well, yes, but then if you are to bid, let me give you an example. Bill Power, okay, Bill Authority did uh, a bidding process and they got nine cents. But the nine cents they got was without land, without transformers and the transmission. So the company coming in to do the solar mm -hmm. was only coming in, the nine cents is only for the infrastructure that they are bringing in to generate the power. Mm -hmm. But the land, the transformer and the transmission was not part of the nine cents. Now, going forward, if you now ask companies, so if the government now says, oh, I think nine cents is what I can get, and if I can bid, this is what I can get, it's wrong information. There are technocrats who work in the ministries, energy commission, that know what the world market price of some of these things are. Mm. Another thing that also confuses Ghana is the cost of borrowing when it comes to investments into sub-Saharan Africa. Somebody will say, oh, but I mean, in Europe, is this, it costs this much, or in Europe, they can do for this much. If a company borrows to spend the money or invest the money in Germany, the rate is different from when he's borrowing to invest the money in Ghana or sub-Saharan Africa, because there is a risk which the power that be in Europe put on investment in West Africa or sub-Saharan Africa. So it becomes a bit ingenious if you try to compare things in Europe and things in Ghana or West Africa, so to speak, because if a company has money, yes, 
they will borrow and hardly does any of these companies take money from their coffers to come and invest in Ghana. Mm. Most of them go to the financial market to borrow for the investment. And the cheapest I've seen for investment in Ghana is between 6 to 8% on wow. the dollar. So, I mean, if in Europe they are borrowing for 2%, 3%, and the cheapest coming to Sub-Saharan Africa is between 6 to 8%, it tells you that it will be difficult to get um, price per kilowatt hour on the solar the same prices that they are getting in Europe. Mm -hmm. So the technocrats can work it out and know that within reason, if we are getting 10 cents or 11 cents for solar, it's okay. Because, look, what we are getting for thermal, we all know what the gas prices are, mm. what the pass-through cost of the gas is, and what we are selling them to me and you. So if somebody can come in and say, look, I'm going to do 10 cents, or the feeding tariff is 10 cents, then that's all well and good. Let that person come in. The problem with the bidding is the time at which the person has to wait. Because government has to now determine the times at which this bidding is done. So if, as, as we speak, mm -hmm. for one and a half years, this, the government came into power, there hasn't been any documentation or any drive to even do documentation for a bidding. So what does that happen? It means that all the companies that comes into Ghana wanting to do solar have to wait. So it will slow down the investment in the renewable energy. Mm -hmm. Also, I'll give you an example on wind, okay? Yeah. To do wind... You need to put a reading meters in various parts of the country to determine the wind speed, okay? There has to be a wind speed of a certain size before you can put wind turbines in certain areas to do wind. Okay. You can't just come into the country and say, oh, I want to do wind. I'm putting one in Kojokrom, I'm putting one in Obwasi, I'm putting one here. No. There is a wind measure which is done by Meteo to tell you the wind speeds in various parts of the country. And every technology in, in generating wind has a certain minimum wind speed it needs in that area. Mm -hmm. So for me, to be able to even <clears throat> think about investing in wind, I need to now invest money in the studies. So I need to buy the wind speed measures to put them in various parts of the country. Now I'll give you an example. I went to Meteo to try and get data on wind speeds around the country. Just that data alone is about 5,000 Ghana cities. Let me, hold on, let me take a quick break and come back. 5,000 Ghana cities. I thought it would be available, uh, you know, free for everybody to access, but we're coming straight back. Well, thank you very much for staying and literally. My Miss Ghana Minchiro Bibia, Eframa Ebo. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they, the Meteo has to make money. You remember I recently? Guess they, I guess they have a uh, point. Uh, uh, yes. You remember recently they were trying to take? They're saying that uh, Ghana Airport owes them money because mm. they also they bought those uh, meters, the wind speed cal uh, meters to put in various places to determine those, and they collect that data mm -hmm. to sell to companies like myself who comes in and wants the data. Mm. So. Because you don't know where the wind blows or where you need the speed, you have to buy as many data as oh, possible. We're told the, the, the Volta Lake is, is like a wind corridor. Being... Yeah, but that's what we are told. But where is the data? I mean, in Ghana, we are tend to be fun of telling people things verbally. I mean, look, we are in a competitive world. The investor comes into the country. He says, look, I can do X, Y, Z for you. A company was even prepared to say, look, we will even give you the machines to go and do the work. Just get a PPA signed, a power purchase agreement signed, and a bank will guarantee. We'll give you the machines and go and set up, and we'll actually bring in these turbines, huge turbines, to set up their wind farms. But they can't just do it on verbal. If somebody says, oh, there's a, the, the Kusumbu or the Volta Lake is a wind corridor, where is the data? So you need to go to Meteo, and Meteo will give, Meteorological Survey Department of Ghana will give you the data. But you see, their data is at ground speed. They, they, they set their meters at a certain speed on the ground. Mm -hmm. To do wind, you need to calculate the speed about 80 meters up in the sky. So when you find the areas where the ground speed is acceptable, mm -hmm. then you now have to invest your money into putting up these, either you get MTN mask or you put on your own post to take the readings for maybe a year or two. Now, all these costs, it's your money as, an as somebody who wants to do this investment. Yeah. So if you're saying I should do tender, how am I going to do tender? If I know I invest this money, I can go and get a PPA, 
at my own time and invest the money, then it's easier for me to do those uh, feasibility and pre-feasibility studies. But if government wants to do tender, it means government wants to do those feasibility studies and share the feasibility studies to everybody and say, look, here or there or here, we have done this feasibility. We think we can do 20 megawatts of this energy. Please come and tender. But government does not have money to do any studies. So unless they find a way, if somebody can do five, mega, uh, five cents per kilowatt hour and a person is doing 10 cents, it's because the cost involved in trying to get all these things done, okay, mm -hmm. he needs to recover the money. So if you are going to pay Matthew 3000 or 5000 for the initial data, you have to go to Canada or the US to buy all these barometers to put them in various places where you need to now calculate wind speed. Mm -hmm. Then you now need to um, go to get people that you pay, okay, to get all this information for one year or two years. All this cost is what you call risk equity. Nobody's going to lend you money to do that. It's your own money to spend. So it's a bit dis incentive if you ask me that you do the bidding route because that one government needs to play a bigger role doing the feasibility and giving us the data because you're going forward <coughs> with what president said uh can we start with you know putting solar on s schools and uh, hospitals and big big institutions get them off the grid and gradually you know make them solar rather than going for the huge solar farms? No, I have never been in favor of huge solar farms. I have always been in favor of the embedded technology, which is, like you said, schools. Get schools to be, go solar. Mm -hmm. Get ministry buildings to go solar. Take them off the grid in modular approach. The big grandiose doesn't always work. So yes, we can start off with schools. Not even the whole school can start off with. Maybe the dining hall can start off with being solar. Mm. The dormitories can start off with being solar. Let's approach it that way. But a little problem we find ourselves in Ghana now. You see, it's strange. Three, four years ago, we didn't have enough power. So there was a big drive to get a lot of generation into the country. Mm. Now, as a country, we find ourselves in a very peculiar situation. Now, the government wants us to consume more electricity because it has contracted all these generating plants that are sitting there which has contrast to say that even if i don't take the power you generate i'm still gonna pay you money so the government need us to take the power and consume more because if not government pays these generation companies money just to sit there recently there was a publication that says that i do there is a 780 megawatts of idle plants and we're going to pay them like 2.4 billion Ghana cities mm. or something. It's not necessarily idle, but if you now contracted, let's say, car power to mm -hmm. give you 500 megawatts and they are only doing 200 megawatts because you don't need a 300, it means you pay them the 300 mm. that they are not doing. Mm. So now some of the uh, drive, like the reduction in these, the reduction we saw recently, 30% mm -hmm. for industries, non-residential customers, residential 17.5. Mm -hmm. All those is to encourage a lot of the companies and non-residential customers who went off the grid and were using generators to generate their own. Because most hotels yeah. and most restaurants were using their own generators because it was cheaper. Mm -hmm. Now that the 30% is gone off, it's going to allow all of them because it's now cheaper from the 15th of December. It will be cheaper mm -hmm. for them to be on the grid than run their own generator. Mm -hmm. So that it's a peculiar situation we find ourselves. Now we have the electricity, we need to encourage people to use more. So it is the, a bit of a medium to long term approach mm -hmm. if we want to now put the schools and the MDAs off the grid. That is not so much of an urgent situation now because now we need people to actually consume more. Let me divert a little bit uh, <clears throat> and we'll come back to solar. Uh, even though we have in excess, should we still be adding our usual 10-5% or we have to stay put a little bit? Well, it's all about the planning. You see, in the Energy Commission uh, forecast for the years, they thought that by now, in 2018, we should be somewhere around 2,500 megawatts without a peak, without VALCO. Mm -hmm. And you see, in most of the things calculation the Energy Commission does, 
they need to look at Valco. Valco has been a white elephant that nobody seems to talk about them mm -hmm. anymore. But if we really want to move on as a country, our energy mix, we should look at Valco working, because that is the only way that we get industrialization in terms of alumina, the mm -hmm. bauxite, and all the things, the manganese we've been talking about. But let's leave that aside for a bit. Now, we are just at peak. We are just a little bit over 2,000. A little bit over 2,000. At some days, we are below 2,000 megawatts in terms of the demand that we have. Mm -hmm. But as of now, we're supposed to be around 2,500. So yes, if you do not keep your eye on that ball, in 2025, you might have a rush that comes in and you have not increased your capacity enough accordingly. Mm -hmm. So in, with time, you know, there was a lot of power purchase agreement that were deferred. Mm -hmm. A lot was signed. The MPP government came in and said, look, we can't have all these power purchase <coughs> agreements. Come on. Some were defined. 23, I hear. Yeah. Some were deferred to 2023, 2025, 2024. So if those are to come in gradually, as the country now increases in population, mm -hmm. middle income base expands, industry, medium to small scale, then yes, the planning is very important because if you look at the past, when we've had doom so, it's always been like 10 years intervals. Seven to ten years. Every seven to ten years we've had them so. Because the planning has not been on course. So when we are in this seemingly the light is on mm -hmm. approach, politicians and the people thereof go and look at other things. But now is the first time that we are actually having a situation where people are trying to say, look, let's not keep our eye off the ball. Let's try and increase our capacity going forward. The only thing that will save us is we need to now generate cheap and affordable electricity. So not only can we now sell to Ghana, but we can also sell to our ECOWAS neighbors. Because if the generation that we are doing in Ghana is too expensive, our neighbors won't buy them. Mm -hmm. And though they need power, they won't take from us. Because we are generating electricity, and all the plants will be sitting there because if we generate them, it will be too expensive. I mean, uh what would then happen? Because, uh, like we, we uh, like you said, <clears throat> we have in excess. If if we bring in the solar, then what we going to end up paying for all these energy that we're not using? Aren't we going to be shooting ourselves? No, we are not. Because bear in mind, there are also communities that are not on the grid. Okay. So bear in mind, we we don't have hundred percent electricity coverage in Ghana. Okay. So one of the things that I heard the president also say is that he gave himself a deadline that he wants to connect all the uh, country, those that are not on the grid back on the grid. So there's a huge chunk of the country that is still not on, 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 on the grid. Correct. So in 2018, there are parts of the country that don't have electricity. And these are not just bushes. These are like s proper urban, not urban, but mm. they are developed towns that towns. don't have electricity. So if the government finds the money, to put all these communities on the grid, then obviously there are more people on the grid, then you need more electricity to serve them. So, and there's population growth. Mm. Now, every year you have new bank worker or new person come on, they want to go and rent a place, people are building, you see that development is coming. Mm. So there is the middle income base which are expanding and they are the ones who buy the microwaves and all those things in mm. their houses. So they will put a lot more pressure on the grid. So. There ain't going to be a situation where you're going to have, when the solar thing is coming in, you are going to have excess in terms of, but you need to balance it out. That's why planning is key. Mm -hmm. If you take, because look, you, secondary schools are one light, one fan, really. They, nobody, I don't know about now, but when we were in school, there were no air condition. So, no. exactly. So the fan, <coughs> the dormitories and the dining halls are just fun and bulb. Mm -hmm. So those ones can easily go on solar. And they can save them a lot of money and government otherwise not necessarily paying for the bills anyway they can use the solar so yes industrialization is to kick in what they would need would overpass all the uh, communities we are taking off the grid just to give them the one bulb one light which uses the the solar which is what you need so you need to balance out the communities coming on the grid vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis the industries that are going to come up with all your one district, one factory, and all those things that you mm -hmm. want to do. So it's planning. You need proper planning going forward. Now we are okay. Short term, medium term, we are good. But it's the medium to long term that we need proper planning and a balance in the basket to be able to balance it out. Uh, <clears throat> let me take you to something the president said. 
uh, and then it says the attainment of utility scale solar electricity from about 22.5 megawatts to 250 megawatts. Additionally, the president stated that 200,000 solar systems for households, commercial and government facilities in urban and selected non-electrifying rural community uh, will be installed. I think we have the voice, so let's, let's, let's hear. ...is located around the equatorial sun belt with many parts of the country enjoying high levels of solar irradiation all year round. She's endowed with abundant solar resource, which can be exploited to increase significantly the contribution of renewable energy in the country's power generation mix. It is unfortunate that despite the abundance of sunshine, our energy mix comprises 59% fossil fuels, 40% hydro, and only 1% solar. As co-chair of the group of eminent advocates of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, I am fully aware that SDG number 13 urges us, quote, to take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts, unquote. On the basis of my country's specific needs, government is keen on developing utility scale solar energy projects, as well as accelerating the development of mini grid solutions in off-grid and island communities for lighting, irrigation, and other economic activities. To this end, and in keeping with our commitments under the Paris Agreement, we will align the following solar energy programs for implementation by 2030. One, attachment of utility scale electricity from about 22.5 megawatts to 250 megawatts. Two, scaling up the installation of 200,000 solar systems for households, commercial and governmental facilities in urban and selected non-electrified rural communities. Three, Establishment of 55 mini-grid electrification systems with an average capacity of 100 kilowatts. These systems will be based on solar PV technology, which will be hybridized with other generation options to serve islands and off-grid communities. That's it. So to 22.5 megawatts to 250 megawatts 200,000 solar system for households commercial government facilities it's a fairly big ambition fairly big ambition and these are to be done ppp it's not government wanting to do them themselves it's private um public partnership or just a private company coming in to do it just because i mean it's in but the point is the necessary incentive has to be on the ground. You see, if you want to have solar, maybe if you are able to put in solar in the next two, three years, solar mm -hmm. will probably be cheaper because the infrastructure is there and the sun is free. Because mostly what, gen what determines your energy cost is the fuel source. Mm -hmm. Okay, So maybe if I come in and say, look, I can charge you nine cents per kilowatt hour to do you solar. If you now pay that over like maybe two years, after two years, it's practically free yeah. because the sun is free, which is your fuel source is free. So what the government needs to do is to look at the investment cost that most of these private people coming in to do it. Now, it's all well and good to, to enumerate all the things you want to do. But then if you don't give the right price for the investor to now risk his money in the investment, then obviously it's not going to happen. Government has social responsibility to the nation. So if government had money, or government decided, decided look, we are going to now take money from X place to implement all these things the government is talking about, then hey, we all clap. But obviously, that's not the case. 
government wants all this mini grid that he wants to do or government wants to do you need people like myself to raise the investment to come in and build them but we can't do it if you don't give us the right price and it won't happen if you want to do competitive bidding because competitive bidding yes might work for you in some cases but bear in mind technology is different because unless you have a middle ground in technology and say that look these are the technologies i want to use then everybody should provide me this technology. But that means government needs to find the money to do the feasibility for that project. Then issue out the RFP, which is a request for proposal, for people to come and bid. But as it stands now, government don't want to do feasibility. But government wants to do all the things that has been listed. One of the good projects that was done last year and some years back is the project that was started by Energy Commission, where it says that, look, if you want to the rooftop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 751, <coughs> 751 people sign up to that project. So those are some of the things that Energy Commission and the Ministry can continue. Okay, because that was a good initiative. That 7, if 751 um, individuals or entities actually sign on to that, you've actually gone from zero to 751. So going forward, if government wants to do some of these, it needs to come up with incentive to incentivize the Residents, mm -hmm. the average Ghanaian, to also take up some of these um, projects. So let, let me pick you on average Ghanaian. I mean, th there are a few wealthy people in Ghana who can easily afford solar. But somehow, even though we say solar is expensive, the average, the average, but the above average guy also hasn't bought into it. I mean, it's dedication. Okay, what does solar do for you? Most more than average Ghanaian mm. wants an air condition. The early solar couldn't allow you to do air condition because mm. the inverters were not powerful enough to run the air condition. Mm. So it became mostly for the light bulb and fan. Yeah. Anything with big motor to turn or elements were not good for the solar. But now, like I said, the technology has advanced. So yes, now you can have solar that can do air conditioning. So you can have a solar setup in your house where you can have three, four air conditions and it can run it. The only thing is that you have to spend a little bit more money on the inverter, which are the batteries, which actually stores the energy. energy. Okay. So the reason the average or the more than average Ghanaian has not bought into it is the limitations because he doesn't want, well, it's better for him to run the generator because the generator kicks in automatically and powers his AC and he sleeps comfortably. But if he finds out that now there is an affordable inverter available to be able to now also power his air condition, then the more than average Ghanaian will go into it. It's all due to the education and the technology thereof on, in, 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 in the solar space. Mm. I mean, uh, I hope this thing comes to past because we've talked about it and talked about it and talked about it. Are there even going to be any government initiatives to say, look, this is towards your, your panels or these are towards the batteries? Well, that is the initiative that was done by Energy Commission um, some years back. That was where they are saying that if you buy the accompanying equipment, they will now give you the panels to match them. So mm -hmm. if you say, look, I want to spend X amount on maybe inverters and the cabling, they will give you the, 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 the cells the photocells, which is the panels, to match them. You see, it's not just a talk shop. When the president goes out to make some of these speeches, I really want the Ministry of Energy to take some of these things very serious. Renewable energy has become a talk shop. Mm. Whether as a country we are really serious about renewable energy, we've not shown it. We've not, you know? Yes, like I said, the giant leap was the enactment of the act which came into play and nothing you need to be able to put the money where your mouth is and if you leave it for just private companies to come in it's not easy for a private company to go out and bring the investment to do some of these projects the chinese have been around trying to do some of these projects but then do we really also want that part of the kind that part of to go to foreigners we need to empower the Ghanaian. Mm -hmm. Recently, someone tweeted that uh, Ghana has to become the next Wakanda. And I said, yes, the only way we could do that is if we empower the average Ghanaian. Mm -hmm. We're not empowering the average Ghanaian. Even to do a simple studies, like I mentioned, by 
barometers or buy mm -hmm. uh, loggers for rivers and mm -hmm. all those things will cost you something around ten thousand to fifteen thousand dollars. The studies over a period will cost you something like twenty thousand to five thousand dollars. Who has that kind of money to just do as risk equity, just studies? And government is not giving any relief or initiatives in that area. So if we don't do that, you, you see, you need to understand, with this all this sun, sun, sun we're talking about, solar, yes. But bear in mind, it's not every day the sun comes out. Let me, let me put a uh, hold on that because <laughs> I was just going to find out. And apparently there are certain hours of the day that the, ra the rays you get from the sun are just rays. It cannot be converted. We're coming straight back. If you're just joining us, uh, the president in India recently you know, made a very powerful statement that Ghana indeed is going to shift towards solar energy to add to our energy mix. And uh, we've got into the post, we're looking at reliability of the sun. Sun doesn't come up every day, and it's not every part of the day that the sun's rays even generate electricity. So, how reliable is this? same sun because we see it every day so we assume it's there every day well there are also technologies that is out there that is able to harness even the least of rays that's mm -hmm. why i'm saying that there are various technology that's out there there are some panels that need a certain amount of sunshine to convert it mm -hmm. there are some panels that use the least amount of sun rays to also convert it into mm -hmm. Um, energy. So the technology out there is different. And the most important part is the inverters, the batteries that store the energy. energy. In some instances, some can even give you maybe 48 hours. And what happens is that anytime the batteries are fully charged, it will last you maybe 48 hours or more. The rays are there, but since you have not used the 48 hours up, when the sun comes up and the photocells can pick up any rays, it only charges it to the 48 hours. So you always have enough to last you. Yes, there is that. What brought up this conversation was that you need to do a little bit of exercise to find out, do I have enough sun rays? What is the type of solar I need to have? Maybe I live in Kumase. Kumasi doesn't have as much sun as Tamale. Mm -hmm. So if I live in Tamale, I can go and get these uh, roof um, panels for solar, but it will not be conducive for me to have that if I live in Kumasi. Reason being that there's more sunshine in Tamale than there is in Kumasi. So you cannot just get up and go and buy um, solar panels depending on where you live. You might need a certain type of um, solar panels depending on your location so there's a little bit of work that goes into it and these work that's what i'm saying that government needs to set up some a little bit of feasibility to go into these some of um research because look it's, it's risky yes the light is on if the light goes off my generator goes off i don't have diesel i send the boy to go buy diesel he puts it in the light comes on you are wanting you want me to now go into an area that has a lot of uncertainty mm -hmm. and that is why people are not so keen to go into those areas but if the president want all these things done then they need to spend some money to one educate the people and two do the basic research that oh if you live in tamale in this zone you need this type of solar panels if you live in brown ahafo it rains this much the sun is in this time of the year, is this much, you need these panels. In Kumasi, Greater Accra, you need these type of panels. That information is not there. People are just around, a private man wants to do that. Somebody comes and says, okay, I'll sell you these panels, I'll sell you these inverters, mm -hmm. and it's installed. But we need a lot of work and studies to be able to be sure how and what you need at what point in time. Uh, one of the issues that came up in the past was the duties and taxes on these panels. And then you're thinking, that, oh, hold on, you know, we need them to get us off the grid and you're penalizing us and then, well, I'll stay on the grid. I mean, is there one thing that you, you think they should look at? Um, well, yes, it would help if we don't tax the solar panels. To even improve, look, if the government goes off and say that, look, we are going to do massive solar projects, mm. we need X amount of solar. Mm -hmm. It might be enough 
for somebody to even set up the assembly plant in Ghana. Mm. Because look, what generates industry is the market. And that's something that in Ghana we are doing wrong. We are trying to set up all these factories without even thinking about the markets or the need for these products. What drives and what will make me or any other investor comes in and set up in Ghana is that if the government comes and says, look, like the president said, we are going to now invest maybe $5 million in panels. Straight away, someone sits there and said, hold on, I can set up a factory for $100,000. Why don't I set up in Ghana? And if local content will come to play, then I can set up the assembly plant in Ghana. Mm. So then straight away, you are now generating all the in industrialization that you need from just creating the demand. Okay? But if you don't go ahead and create the demand and say that, look, I'm, as a government, I'm going to spend this money. Because that is the driver. Individuals cannot come and say, I'm going to spend this money. The biggest employer, the biggest person with the, all the MDAs and the state-owned enterprises is government. So if government decides to spend X amount of money, it might ginger people, some of the one district, one factory that government wants to do, can be assembling of solar panels. Education. Yes. I think uh, uh, listening to you, I think that's one thing that's really missing here is education. Because there are mega factories in Ghana, there are you know, few rich guys in Ghana who could have easily just diverted and gotten off the grid, but we all sit in the grid, even through doom so we just sit and wait for the lights to come. We never, I mean, how do we convince people? Because it's, it's like a black and white thing. So how do we convince people that, look, it's a good idea, have a look at it. It may have the initial cost, but, you know, and, you and, right. and it's the work of Energy Commission. Energy Commission are supposed to educate us through the Civic and Ministry of Information and all those to educate us on some of these things. A lot of people have these smartphones and they don't even use them to read. Mm -hmm. They just use them for WhatsApp and all the things <laughs> they use them for. If you really think, look, like you read from the beginning of the program, Germany, Italy, and all these advanced countries have used solar to their benefit to a large extent. Why is it that we sit here and we can't do that? It's like you said, education. But we can also educate ourselves mm. because the technology is there. Now, I can honestly tell you that we've moved on from the times when we were not too sure of the technology. Now, the technology has far advanced. Mm -hmm. And it's not like in the 80s or the 90s or the early 2000s when technology for solar mm -hmm. was very inconsistent. Mm -hmm. Now, it's really advanced. So if we want to, as a nation, I think, I don't like always saying that government, government, government. But this is one area that I think government should take the lead in the education and also providing some small money for a little research here and there to make sure that people in the right place of the country have the right technology um, the right information you say you're going to give um, solar lanterns to the villagers and people who are off the grid it's good news i mean but if you give the solar lantern to the person what is the education on how to use the solar lantern at what time of the day can he charge it if in Siomuna the whole day, does he still charges it? You know, so we need to, I mean, private people cannot come and bring their money to educate people unless there is some incentive for me to do that. Mm -hmm. But the person responsible and the person making the big speech is the government. And to me, so far, I think they have not led the way in the solar drive. Well, let's, let's hope this, this, this will be that turning point because the solar you know, conversation seems to have a, a wave on its own. It comes and it goes and it comes and it goes. Let's hope this would uh, be the one that really changed. I don't know why, but I just... Let's just well, and also, I think when it comes to renewable, we shouldn't always now on solar because there are other renewables. There's biogas, there is wind energy that I talked of earlier, mm -hmm. and there is the waste to energy. You know, we have... I mean, if somebody asked me the last time, ah, could you... How come we have a lot of waste in Ghana, but waste to energy has never taken off? Mm. Okay, because look, again, research. Where do we dump our waste? Okay, if you go to our areas where we dump our waste, you'll be surprised what informed how we dump the waste there. Somebody will do a query somewhere. And when it's an abandoned query, the municipality decides that we want to fill the query. So that is where they dump waste. How can that place be a dumping site. 
and you expect to now have a waste to energy facility you mm. need to have good areas engineered landfill sites okay engineered landfill site to now dump your waste so that if somebody wants to now tap the gas that comes from the landfill mm. site they can tap the gas into energy if the person wants to actually do the old-fashioned yenshino you know that kind of thing <laughs> then the person can also do those things but it's a bit old-fashioned mm. if you expect people to come in and start burning stuff to generate um, electricity but it's mostly to do with landfill sites where there is gas that is transmitted from the pipes which is built in a landfill site to go to thermal plants to now run the thermal to, to run a thermal plant but we don't plan and engineer well mm. and that is the problem well solar energy solar energy uh, let's see what this new wave of solar conversation will generate. I hope it will get down to the roots so that the pressure on the grid then. Uh, 20 seconds, do you think if we, lots of people use solar, the price of uh, you know, energy will go down because demand and supply? No. As, as in coming from fossil fuel, no, so it wouldn't, because you see, also the, the it's, only thing that some of, us are, some of us are, are striving for is the day where industries pay less than residential, I and that's where we need to get to. Get to. We, right now, industry subsidizes residential. Yes, yeah. We yes, need yes, to yes, get yes. to the point where we have cheap, efficient electricity that industry pay less, and that is when we see a lot of these uh, rejuvenation that we want in our industrialization. Well. Uh, 024-366-2001 024-366-2001 Tantees, they make my shirts for the show Give them a call, get yourself a nice shirt We're talking to Kwejo Poku, an energy expert What's your dad's name? Nana Asase Ayibua for the second Nana Asase Ayibua the second Happy uh, first anniversary on the 8th of uh, April we can't be there, but we'll be there with you in spirit. Enjoy. <laughs>